name is Lindsay Wyrick and this is an art instructor video from Royal and Langnickel. In this video we're going to explore acrylics. Acrylics are wonderful and known for their ability to be vibrant, layerable, and dry quickly. If you've ever wanted to paint with acrylics this is a great place to start. I'm going to show you the different supplies you're going to need for acrylic paintings from paints, brushes, and other materials you might want along the way, and then we're going to go through two paintings step by step. We're going to start off with the Sunset Mountain Vista here. It's a very fun and easy way to get used to the way acrylics blend and dry. After that, we're going to work on this adorable puffin, which may look a little complex, but it really isn't. You're going to learn how to control your lights, darks, value, add texture, and pretty much use all those supplies that you just bought. Are you ready to get started on your acrylic painting adventure? Well, let's go to the table and get started. Let's take a look at some of the supplies you're going to need to begin acrylic painting. First, of course, you have your paint. And uh, these are acrylic paints, and you always wanna check if you do have a bunch of different paints in your stash, make sure you're only using one type of paint at a time because they could be incompatible and actually repel one another. So here are my acrylic paints in this little jar here. You're gonna want uh, a paper towel or a rag for cleaning your brushes, brushes, a palette knife for mixing, a little palette to put your paint on, and I also like to have a sheet of palette paper or freezer paper, and then I have a piece of that under here, and what that is is a place for me to mix my paint on, and um, then I can throw it away when I'm done. So it saves a lot of cleaning time, and you really don't want your acrylic paint to go down your drain. So when you first get your acrylic paints, you're going to notice that they're sealed, and that's just to keep them nice and fresh in the store. So what you want to do is take your cap, and you'll see there's a little bit of a, kind of like a, a pointy part on the inside of your cap, on the back end, and you're going to press the cap, the wrong side of the cap, down on the tube, and that's going to open up or break the seal on that paint. With acrylics, you only want to squeeze out what you think you're going to use um, in about a half an hour because paint, acrylic paint dries really quickly. So for the colors I've laid out here, I have laid out some primaries, which is crimson red, ultramarine blue, and lemon yellow. And then I also put um, a little phthalo blue because I know that's a little bit cooler and deeper blue and it will be handy in this landscape. I also have some white and black. Typically I don't use black very often but I find for beginners it can be really useful. And after I've squeezed that out I'm just going to set these aside but I always keep the paints I'm using um, outside of my jar of paints while I'm working on a project so when I go to refill my palette I don't grab the wrong paint by accident. You're better off to stick with a smaller palette of colors and mix to get the other colors you need. Now when you have, whoops, <laughs> wear old clothes so you don't get paint on yourself. I'm going to set that off to the side and wipe my thumb off here. Um, when you get brand new brushes, you're going to notice that they feel a little stiff and that's because the brushes contain sizing and sizing is a special glue that protects them at the store and in shipping. Round brushes come with a little clear plastic collar on them. After you remove them, um, after you purchase them, throw them away. By trying to put them back on again, you can actually damage your brush. So those are, those are disposable. You don't want to keep those around. So then what you're going to need to do is wash these brushes before you paint with them because they're really stiff. So I've got my jar of uh, clear water here, and usually clear water will do the trick. If you still feel a little residue, you can wash them off with uh, soapy water, and dish soap or baby shampoo would be just fine for that. You don't need to have an expensive brush cleaner for acrylic paints. So I'm going to clean each of those off and make sure the bristles feel nice and soft. Now another thing when you're working with acrylics, um, it's a good idea to dry your brush off before dipping into the paint because you can end up diluting your paint a lot um, if you go right from the water right into your paint and um, that can lead for streaky coverage on your canvas and um, it can actually lift up the paint underneath. I'm working on a canvas panel here. It's just kind of a hard board that has canvas glued to it, which is a very economical way for beginners to begin. So we're going to start by um, painting a landscape, and the first thing I want to do is put in a horizon line. And I'm going to move my brushes kind of out of the way a little bit. And I am going to start by using my largest brush that came in my kit here, it's a uh, half inch or number 10 flat. And I'm going to pick up some white and put it on my palette. And I'm going to grab a little bit of yellow and add that. And I'm going to mix it. Now, if I'm, if I'm using, doing a big amount of paint, 
it's a good idea to use your palette knife to mix and the reason for that is because um, you don't want to get your paint up into the metal part of your brush that's called the ferrule and once you get paint up that high it can dry inside the metal and spread your bristles apart and then you don't have a nice fine uh, brush to use anymore I think that's a pretty good amount and if I'm just mixing a tiny little bit I'll mix it with a brush but the palette knife is really handy for that and you simply just wipe a palette knife off to clean it. So I'm going to go just a little bit above um, the middle of the canvas here and make a line across and this is my horizon line. My mountains are going to overlap this a little bit that we're going to paint on in a few minutes. Um, so I want to make sure I'm, I'm down below where the mountain range is going to be just so I don't end up with a white a gap of like white canvas. And then I'm going to start using horizontal strokes to spread that paint out. You want to work fairly quickly on this so that you'll be able to blend into your adjacent colors. You may prefer using stretched canvas for your work. I find that paint spreads a little bit easier on a canvas panel and canvas panels are much more economical to frame as well. So keep that in mind when you're choosing your surface to paint on. You can also use acrylics on wood, tin and other surfaces. It's a very versatile paint. I'm going to tip my painting up for a second and just make sure that line is straight because it can be a little uh, deceiving when you're working on a table and you can always work on an easel. Generally if your brushes are short handled they're designed to work uh, sitting or at a table and if your brushes are longer handled they're designed to use at an easel but of course you can use you can interchange them those are just kind of a rule of thumb. Now I want to add a little bit of red to that I want to make kind of an orange so I'm going to add a little bit of red and I'm actually going to use my palette knife to get my yellow so I don't end up contaminating my little pot of yellow paint there. Red is a stronger color than yellow so I will need more uh, more yellow than red in my mix. If I was doing a tiny little painting like uh, oh painting on rocks is really popular right now I could just brush mix the small amount that I would need. So now I'm going to blend right into that. We're going to get some nice sunset colors here. Don't worry if it doesn't look perfect, okay? Have fun and get used to the feeling of the paint on the canvas. The best way to learn how to paint a new uh, with a new medium is to paint with it. And I'm just going to try to get that transition to blend. Now, there are mediums available that will keep your paint wetter longer, but I try to I would recommend keeping it simple as you start out so you don't get overwhelmed by all the possibilities. Now I'm going to clean my brush because I want my sky to get a little pinker. I'll rinse it off really well and then I'm going to blot it. Get off all that extra water. And now I'm going to, I'm actually going to wipe off my palette knife because I'm going to mix with that. Get off all the residual color. And I am going to grab some white and a little bit of red and mix those together. And you can see how strong that red is. See how it overtook that white? So now what I'm going to do is actually load my brush up with white. Now white is probably a color that you're going to have to purchase uh, before your other colors. You're going to run out of that first. I'm going in with the white and just kind of blending it down into my orange a little bit. That's going to give me a nice transition color to go into the pink in the sunset. I try to do long fluid strokes so I don't end up with brush marks. When in doubt, rinse it out. That's what I say about, about painting, okay? If you're not sure if you should rinse it, go ahead and rinse it. Now I'm going to grab some of this pink. And notice when I load my brush, I don't let the paint go up to that metal part. I keep it just on the, like, the bottom half of those bristles whenever possible. I mean, sometimes it happens you're painting fast and, and your paint goes a little wild. Um, but just try to be aware of it because starting that habit now uh, as a beginner is going to make it a lot easier to, uh, to keep your brushes a lot longer. And that's going to save you a lot of money in the long run. And I'm just going long horizontal strokes here. Now I'm going to grab, I mean, I'm going to keep my brush dirty here. I'm going to grab some white and I'm going to paint right on that bottom edge where the uh, pink is kind of blending in to the color below. And that's going to help us get that ombre look. I'm just going to pick up white to do that with because there's enough color on my brush and there's enough color on the canvas. 
I want a smooth look. So if I see if I see that kind of broken line there, that means I don't have enough media on my brush. That means I need to go pick up a little more paint. And I think I want a little bit of a purple tone, so I'm going to just brush mix, brush pick up a little bit of that ultramarine blue, and I'm going to add it into that pink, okay, that I already mixed. And I'm going to put some of that up here at the top. I'm actually going to go the rest of the way on the canvas with that. And bring it across. This makes a lovely kind of mauve, kind of a duller, duller purple. I'm going to pick up a little bit of the lighter shade there just to blend those two together. Long smooth strokes though, that's going to help you um, help you avoid brush marks and getting kind of lifting that color from underneath. So the ultramarine didn't really mix me a good purple, so I'm actually going to try the thalo. Thalo is cooler and more transparent, and sometimes that will give you a brighter color. I'm going to see mixing up some more of that. and see what we get. I'm getting a very dark color here. We'll add a little bit of white to it. And we can add some of that towards the top of our sky. And this would be a nice color for kind of like clouds. And clouds get kind of that um, just really, really dark shadows in them. And I'm going to go ahead and throw in a few clouds. I'm what I like to do for clouds is just kind of make your puffy um, mass and then I just kind of fade out the bottom just blend the bottom out and whatever else is there and just go nice and easy clouds are generally fluffier at the top and they get flatter on the bottom and they can wisp you don't have to have them solid so just try not to overwork them. I think that's the key with clouds. Now you can also paint in a journal. Um, there are some, there are, um, well there's canvas pads, but you can get mixed media paper in a journal that's really lovely to paint on if you feel like, if you feel nervous about wasting a canvas. But never think of it as a waste. If you don't like it, you could always paint over it with a product called Gesso, which is just a flat white paint, and you could paint again. You could even use a house primer for that matter, as long as it's latex based. The key is just to create and have fun, and there's no there's no failure. You either succeed or you learn, right? And I grab a little more pink in that. That one looks a little streaky and dark. Once you put these clouds on, try not to mess with uh, uh, the sky colors underneath again. Now as I get further down, I would like some orange clouds because that's kind of the ones that get kind of glowy from the sun. I just uh, dripped a little bit of water in there, so I want to, when you do that, just kind of try to pour off that water because you don't want to dilute that paint. Sometimes you do, but for this, we really don't. Uh, so to make some nice bright orange, I'm going to brush mix here because I don't need a lot. I'm taking some of that yellow and a little bit of the red. And that's way more red than I need, so I need to add quite a bit more yellow. There we go. And I'm going to do some brighter clouds closer to the horizon. Now, things that are closer to the horizon are smaller generally. They're further away from us, so they appear smaller. So I'm going to try to make just make these kind of smaller little clouds. Just catching that late day sun. Now your paint's fairly dry under these clouds because we painted them so early, so that can be uh, that can be quite useful. You don't have to worry about mixing in with that. And I always say that if you make a mistake, it's just an opportunity to embellish. It's an opportunity to add something new. Maybe a bird will be flying in front of that cloud if you didn't care for it too much. So, so please just try to relax while you're painting. 
Now we're going to work on the mountains, and um, this is this dries really quick, so um, this will probably be pretty much dry while we're mixing our colors. I am going to just move this up a little bit so I have some fresh palette paper handy. And for the faraway clouds, I want really light, um, I mean faraway mountains, I want really light mountains. So I'm going to start with some, um, I'm actually going to put it right out here on my palette. I'm going to grab a little bit of white on its own, because I'm just about out, and I'm going to put a little bit more in my palette. And I'm going to add a little bit of thalo blue to that. And thalo blue is um, a cool blue, so it'd look a little bit more like green than like violet. And you can see mixing that up how it's it's got that pretty cool, um, almost green tint to it. And if you don't if you don't see that tint right away, don't worry. It's one of those things that kind of um, you kind of learn the more you paint. And what we're going to do is we're just going to make ourselves kind of a uh, just a loose mountain range. We're just going to make kind of like peaks. Okay, now this is far away, so it's going to be lighter to our eyes, it's going to be cooler, it's going to be kind of duller. We can even add a little bit of this color into it if we want to make it really dull. A little bit more blue. That's kind of a nice far away mountain color. And what I'd like to do is actually be about two thirds of the canvas with our mountains. So um, some of those I'm gonna have, I'm gonna bring up a little bit higher. So I do get that. It's called the rule of thirds. Our eyes like to divide things up into threes. We find that um, we just find that more pleasing as humans. So if we can replicate that in our artwork, it's just gonna naturally look a little bit nicer. And I'm just mixing up what I need as I go because it's okay if I have a little bit of variation. I don't need everything to be absolutely the same color here. It's gonna look nicer if I do have a little bit of variation. I'm getting pretty close to the top of that ferrule though, so I am kind of uh, trying to keep an eye on that so I don't get a mess that I have to clean up later on my brush. It happens. This really isn't going to have a lot of detail. I'm just going to kind of drag that down. I'm going to grab a little bit of white and that will give me almost like a little bit of a misty look in the bottom of the mountains here. And white is also an opaque color, meaning the light doesn't pass through it. So if you're having a hard time covering something, um, adding some white to it can make it a little more opaque and make it cover up what you're trying to cover underneath a little bit better. And I'm just kind of feathering out the, the bottom here. We'll want more detail in our brush strokes as we work down the canvas, but right now we'll try to keep it uh, as smooth as we can. Our next layer is going to be a little bit darker, a little bit bolder, and it's going to come forward a little bit. So what we're going to do is we are going to mix a little ultramarine blue, and I'm going to mix right on that same puddle where I mixed before. And I am going to add a little bit of white to that. And I am going to add a little bit of that other blue, that thalo blue to it. Actually, I added a little bit of black to it. So you know what? I'm going to save this color and that is going to be for my uh, foreground colors. We're going to mix that again. So, you know, keep in mind when you are mixing, you're, you know, sometimes you grab the wrong color. So we got ultramarine, we got thalo blue, and we have white. And let's see what we get here. Oh, that's nice. I think I'm going to need a little more of it though. So I am going to go ahead and grab the rest of those two blues and actually add a little bit more ultramarine blue because I am out of that. I'll put a little dollop there and I will put a smidgen more in my palette in case I need it in a bit. All right, there, that's a little bit better. And I'm gonna wipe my brush off. And here's a fun technique. Um, you can actually paint with your palette knife. We're gonna do that a lot in the last layer of, um, layer of mountains, but if you wanna get used to it, what you wanna do is load up your paint so it's kind of on the edge of the knife 
And then what you can do is kind of pick an area where you want your, your you know, most prominent mountain to be. Maybe we'll have even one come up a little bit higher than the others. And you're just going to streak it. And this is useful because if you are nervous, if you have a hard time being really random and making those natural shapes, it can help you um, just just do it because uh, because there's you just kind of have to go with what the knife gives you. Um, it does give you more of a uh, like um, I would say less consistent or less predictable result, which is good. But it, and it also gives you a little bit of a um, of a sparse result. So it can make it can kind of look like you've got some snow in there, which could be what you're looking for. But it might not. So um, after you apply this first bit of mountains with the knife. I recommend that you grab your same flat brush again and you go through and you help kind of fill some stuff in. If you see a shape that you really love or a bit of white peeking through that you really love, you can leave that. But I don't want this layer to be um, as bold as my final layer, so I am just going to quickly drag some of that out. And I want some of the brush strokes to show here. I want um, I want to see some direction of maybe these are where the rocks are are kind of the the side of the mountain shearing down the the valleys and whatnot. So I am leaving some of that right in there. I think it looks nice. And I do want to use up whatever paint I've left and just drag it down as far as I can. That way, if I change my mind with some of the foreground mountains, I'll be able to. Um, I'll be able to, you know, not bring them up quite as high as I might have to if I didn't have anything painted under there. Because we're overlapping. I hope that makes sense. We're overlapping, so, um, so I just want to make sure I've at least covered everywhere I want that to be, everywhere I want the uh, this layer of mountains to be. It's. A, I think the palette knife technique is really useful to help you get those um, those edges that. You might be a little intimidating after you've spent time, you know, working on the sky and the other mountains and you if you're afraid you might mess it up, it can kind of alleviate that fear a little bit. Now I do think I would like to maybe grab some highlight color here. I'm just grabbing white on my dirty brush. I'm just gonna drag down some some uh details basically wherever I think there might be like the edge facing the the kind of sun that's going down just grabbing a little bit of that or it could be, even be the moon since it's such a white highlight I don't want it to blend into those mountains back there but I just want to give a little more texture to these guys I can also grab, let me do one more with a white, then we can also grab a little bit of black. Not a bunch though, because black is going to be one of the um, main colors in the foreground mountains, but I could grab a little bit. In fact, I can just grab that color back there that we accidentally mixed in with the black, and I can add some, some shadows. Maybe I will just grab a little black into that. Get a little bit of that color in there. There. Okay, so last but not least, we're going to do this foreground area. I'm going to go back with my palette knife and I'm going to grab that paint that we moved. I'm going to bring that back here. I am going to use up um, the rest of the black that I had pulled out, which is probably about, I would say, maybe like a blueberry size dollop. And I am going to grab the blues that I have left over and just kind of mix it all up there. Now I used a little palette that came with my kit to keep my paints kind of clean and out of the way, but you could always just squeeze it right out onto your palette, your mixing area. Um, it's completely up to you. So I think I want to kind of start with a really bold. Um, mountain top maybe even have it kind of come up up like this let it kind of go down in front of those guys 
and pull it across to about two thirds across my canvas there. I'm going to be using a fair bit of paint for this. that basic shape down there and then for the other the other one I don't want to be quite so tall I am going to uh, I'm gonna kind of bring it up like that and get a couple other peaks and take it right off the side of the canvas here okay so this looks messy, I know, but I just wanted to get my, my edges. So I'm going to work on this chunk of mountain first because it is just slightly behind this little chunk here and I want it to be nice and dark. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up some more paint. I'm going to go right from the tube and I'm going to add some a fair amount of black. Now the thicker the paint is that you put on your paper, or your canvas rather, um, the more textured it's going to be. You can actually feel the texture. It's also going to take longer to dry, so keep that in mind as you are working. Now I'm going to add ultramarine to this. Ultramarine has more warm tones to it, so it's going to come towards the viewer. And uh, because of all the black here, that is such a strong color, and that's also going to make it stand out and come towards the viewer. So that's why I'm using these two colors. And it looks fairly fairly black here. It looks almost just like a, a navy, uh, midnight midnight blue or black. And I like the texture that I can get from the knife. I think I'm going to spread a little bit of this out with a paint with the uh, paintbrush, and then go back in with the knife. Remember, you want to uh, you want to blot that off good after you wash it. Make sure I have an even coating at least, and then we can add some texture into that. And I want to bring that color all the way down off the canvas. This is actually real fun. It kind of um, reminds me of finger painting because you can feel the texture of that paint under your brush. Okay, because this is going to be my mountain, this mountain piece right here. So now I do want to add a little bit of, of light. I do want to bring some of those, um, those aspects out. I can do that with either the palette knife or my brush. If, you, um, if you're mixing colors and they get kind of spread out, if you push them into a pile, they'll stay fresher longer. So I would recommend that as you're working. I'm going to wipe off the extra black here and I'm going to dip into some white, which I'm going to put right on my palette. It's just a little easier for me to get that with a knife. And I'm going to grab a little more blue, a little of the same ultramarine blue to tint that white with. Not a lot, as you can see. Just a little bit. I want to make sure it stays. It's going to pick up some of the color underneath, but I just want to make sure it's not super, super white. And I'm loading up. I just want to get some, some of that right on that edge. And I'm going to find kind of... some edges to to highlight. And this is going to give us that look of maybe there's some snow in these high mountains. Keep your towel handy because you will need to wipe that off as your white gets contaminated. And usually less is more so when you get to a point where you're like yeah I like that all right then you'll want to stop and just uh, just leave it be you can always come back in later and add more to it so don't feel like you have to do this all in one go because acrylics you can layer over indefinitely but it is kind of hard to stop because it's really fun <laughs> so now I'm gonna wipe that off and I'm gonna go in with my brush again and I'm gonna grab a little more blue because I feel like I want that front mountain to be a little bit bluer. It's going to come forward to our eyes because this uh, ultramarine blue has warm undertones. Blot my brush off because I don't want to add water to this. 
and I'm just gonna grab that blue and black together that's that mix that we made the same mix we used for that and I'm just gonna fill in over here like I did before because I want to be able to scrape uh, with the knife on there and I want it to have some good coverage underneath and it's all gonna look black pretty much until I scrape over it with the knife and then it'll pick up some other colors I'm not gonna add anything to the white this time I'm just gonna go in with the white on the knife because I know that's gonna pick up plenty now, if you end up at the end of a painting session with a bunch of paint left over, don't fret. You can um, you can scoop it up into your palette and put a little piece of like a press and seal uh, over it. Or something I do is I'll take like a takeout container or an old Tupperware and um, like plastic container, and I'll put a wet paper towel in there, and then I'll just put this little palette right in there and seal it up, and it'll keep it good for like about two weeks. So you know. If you do happen to get out too much, that's that's an option for you to kind of conserve your paint a little bit. Or you could, uh, if you know you want to paint on like a wooden box or something, you can you could base coat it with whatever you had left over. All right, so now I am going to grab some more white on its own, and we're going to do our final details on that foreground mountain. And I'm going to start. I'm going to just take the white and load it up on the edge of my palette knife. And I think this edge there I want to have nice and bright. I want that to stand out from the one in behind. And sometimes it can be difficult to see kind of what you're doing if you've got a lot of glare if you're working at a table. So if you need to, prop it up on some books or lean it up, a, you know, somewhere where you can really see what you're doing, even if it's just for a minute, because that glare can be a little confusing. And there, you have completed your first acrylic painting. I'm going to tip it up a little bit, just so you can kind of see in case you're in case you can't, you can see we've got a little texture there on the uh, the front of the mountains, but it's fairly it's fairly flat. Now, if you go to this point, you're like, I absolutely know I do not like it. And I don't want to keep it. You could um, you could scrape that paint off and let it dry, then paint it white so you could paint it over again. But I honestly think that giving it a little bit of time is really helpful because often when you go back and look at your painting the next day, you see how lovely it is. It's really hard to determine that on your first go. Now, if you did want to add more texture and you had a bunch of this paint left over and you didn't feel like storing it, here's what you can do. I think this looks fine just the way it is, but if I thought, hmm, you know what, it'd be nice to have a little bit of touchable texture there, I can grab that and I can kind of spackle it in wherever I'd want that darker color. And then you'll have a physical texture and a visual texture on your picture. And texture is just like how something feels, right? I can add some of that in there. So that way you'll actually end up with some rocky texture in there, more than you had before and then you don't have to store your paint or throw it out because you already squeezed it out. And I think that's a lot of fun to put a lot of texture into your picture like that. All right. So I'm going to clean up this, uh, my area, and when we come back, we are going to paint a cheerful puffin. Mm -hmm. For this next project, we're going to have to do some sketching on our canvas. I'm going to use a regular pencil, but if that makes you nervous, you can always sketch on paper and use transfer paper to transfer it onto your canvas. Another great idea, if you have it, is to use watercolor pencils to sketch under your acrylic painting, because once you paint on top, the acrylic paint will dissolve the watercolor pencil and you won't even see any pencil marks. But since everyone has a pencil at home, that's what we're going to use today. Now for this puffin, I'm going to start with a shape that encompasses most of it, and that would be a circle. So I'm just going to go in there. I'm going to sketch a little bit darker than I normally would so that you can see it really well, but when you're sketching at home, try to sketch a little bit lighter, all right? I'm just going dark because I want you to be able to see it. So on top of this circle, I'm actually going to make a bump that goes out, and that's going to be for the wing. And then I want an, a circle for the head, so I'm just going to go ahead 
and I go ahead and draw the head. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and put this head shape, which is another circle, right on top. And then I know we have a beak here, and the beak is a triangle. So we're going to go ahead and sketch in that triangle. Now, if it doesn't come out the way you like, that's what the eraser's for. You can go ahead and erase any lines that, that don't look right. I would recommend sketching as much as you can without erasing, and then just go after the lines that don't fit the bill and erase those. It's a lot quicker that way, and you'll build your confidence while sketching. And for the eye, again, it's another circle. So anything can be broken down to easier parts. So please don't be discouraged or worry if you, if you aren't proficient in drawing yet. You'll get there. It just takes a little practice. And I'm just going to kind of sketch out where my darker areas are. So we get these dark feathers on top. So I'm sketching that. And I get a, a wing that's kind of kind of sticking out over there. I want to get that in there. Now they, they're very squat birds. They're, um, we also have a little bit of wattle there. I think that's what it is. It's a little bit of yellow, a little gray in there. Um, the chest has a little bit of black feathers on it, kind of coming around like that. And You go up into the wing area and the, the wing feathers back there. So our feet, the feet are very close to the body. We're just going to put that little leg, little bump for the leg there, and then the feet are coming right out like this, and they are webbed footed birds. So we just go like that to get the webbed foot down, and then we get another one right next to it. And there we go. And tell you what, I am going to um, take a photo of this and put that in a little booklet that accompanies this lesson. So you'll be able to um, photocopy it, size it up if you want to, if that makes it a little easier for you. So don't fret, but please do try drawing it, even if it's on a sketch sketchbook, just so that you get the hang of it. And um, so you have the option of using yours. But I will, um, I will put this in the little booklet as well that came with the art set that you purchased for this tutorial. Okay, and then I just kind of want to rock. He's kind of standing on a rock. These are prevalent, um, very abundant on the coast of Maine. And I just want to get a little bit of a blurry kind of landscape in there. Nothing too fancy, just to kind of break up my, our canvas into threes like we talked about before. It just makes it a little more pleasing to the eye. So now what I'm going to do is grab my eraser and erase the stuff that we don't need. Soft white erasers are great for erasing on watercolor paper as well as canvas because they're so gentle, they're not going to damage anything underneath. You just basically want to get up the excess graphite so you don't have smudges when you go to paint. Sometimes the, um, the graphite can show through on other layers, but that's not, that's not a big deal because we can overlap with our acrylics. But you don't want to be confused by any extra lines, so you can go ahead and just get rid of those right now. Now let's take a look at the colors we're going to paint with. I have for red vermilion, which is an orange-based red. It looks kind of more like, um, like a tomato red than a crimson red. We've got lemon yellow, and you just need a little bit of that, so I just let it share a spot with um, yellow ochre. And uh, make sure you look at the color of the paint, because sometimes it can be a little bit different than what's on the outside of the tube, and that goes for any brand of paint. Then we have Burnt Umber, which is a, a, a nice brown. We have Ultramarine Blue, uh, which is a kind of a purpley blue. It's just a, 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 nice, a nice blue. We have some black, and we have some white. And we are going to begin by getting some background done. And we are going to start off with our largest brush, which is the number 10 flat. And I'm just going to scooch that over so we have some room to mix. I have my palette paper under here as well, so we are all set to do our mixing. I'm going to start by working on the background back here. And um, I'm going to use my palette knife to do some mixing. I'm going to take quite a big dollop of white. I am going to add some ultramarine blue to it. Going to add um, a little bit of burnt umber to it 
and a, just a touch of black. Basically because I know I'm going to use that in the puffin, I want to have this elsewhere in the picture so it doesn't look odd when I bring it out for the puffin. What I'm going for is just a um, kind of like a cool bluish gray. And I like to incorporate as many colors as I can in my background. I want that to have more blue. And we need quite a bit of this color, so, uh, so we're mixing it up with our palette knife. There, that looks about right. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go right in here with my flat brush and use a uh, stroke that's called a scumbling stroke. And what that is, is just kind of like you're making little X's with your brush. Crisscross applesauce, here we go. All right, and then I can brush mix in some other colors, some of the other colors we used on their own. So I can grab a little bit of blue on its own. And this is gonna give us like the soft out of focus texture in the background, which is really pretty. So it's one of these little techniques that it adds a lot, but it's really subtle. And I'm gonna grab some white and do the same thing. We'll be using a lot of white in this <laughs> in this painting too, by the way. White is probably your most used color. So don't be afraid, uh, <laughs> don't, be, don't be worried if you run out of that before everything else is completely normal. I don't want um, the texture of the canvas showing through here, so I will go back in and work over areas to make sure that I'm really filling that canvas. But I do like to see the brush strokes themselves. I'm just trying to get rid of the uh, the canvas texture. I'm gonna go ahead and grab all that white out of there because I just know we're gonna go through it. And we don't know, this could be sky, this could be water back here, but it's it's too out of focus for us to worry about. It's just adding to the atmosphere. And if you're ever on the coast of Maine, and I live in Maine, um, you're gonna notice that it's this is just really kind of steely blue that you see. It's kind of like a, it's, there's a color called Bar Harbor Gray, and that is that is such a good um, depiction of the colors of the water and the, the landscape around the Maine coast. You just, and that's where these birds are. So, um, and I, I am going over the bird a little bit. You see that? Um, you just gotta be careful that you, I mean, just make sure in your mind's eye, you know that where the head is, but you do wanna go over that because you don't wanna have a white halo around your subject. And every once in a while, I'm gonna work back if I feel like, oh, I want a little bit brighter over there. I can go in and do that. Now I think I wanna add a little bit more brown here. Oh, that's quite a bit. That's pretty dark, so I'm gonna grab a little bit of a white and integrate that in a little bit better. Make sure I'm filling the tooth of the canvas. Go over the beak a little bit. Do that a little bit over here so it's not um, unusual to get that color in there. So that's the thing, I mean, it's like, if you do something to one part of the, uh, the picture, you kind of want to do it somewhere else to, uh, kind of cross-pollinate everything. I also might want to just a smidgen of some yellow ochre. Cause it's a nice bright color that could signify uh, sand or sun. But it's basically atmospheric cause everything is, is out of focus. It could be rocks, it could be beach, they could be surf. We're trying to keep it pretty vague. Generally, these birds like to hang out on the rocks and um, islands on the coast of Maine, so they're always kind of on some rock and near some water. And you know, so to have these colors hanging around here is very appropriate. some more of that gray with some blue. I do, I do want to make sure it's fairly dark back here because it's going to get lighter as we come forward. Let's drag some of that color down. Okay, so I'm just going to rinse my brush and dry it off. And our next layer is going to be quite 
uh, bright and white, much, much lighter. So I'm just going to come over into this vicinity where I have the, um, the whiter paint and I want to make kind of a, uh, kind of a, like another horizon. It's not really a horizon line, but it's just kind of like a line of where this, uh, where the uh, the layers of the rocks and stuff that he's hanging out on are. So I'm just bringing that down. So instead of texture being choppy like we had back there, I want it a little bit smoother. And I could add a little bit of yellow ochre in there and warm it up a little bit. And again, I want to fill in the tooth. I don't want to see the sparkle of the canvas in this. But I, I'm keeping it not very textured in here because um, I don't. We're gonna do the rock texture right on this this chunk of rock he's sitting on, so I want that to kind of have a little bit of um, contrast. Bringing in a little bit of that blue. And I'm working fairly quickly so things can blend. Uh, so your environment can determine how quickly your paints dry on you. Um, I am working down in my basement studio, so things stay, you know, they don't they don't dry out too fast on me. But if I was working upstairs by my wood stove, this would be drying out in a flash. So just kind of keep that in mind when you where you're working can have an effect on how quickly your paints dry. I like to start off painting with a big brush because it uh, helps me go a little quicker and helps me not get too fussy with the details. So if you are somebody that gets a little bit worked up and worried about details, then switch to a bigger brush. I think you'll find that it, you know, at least for the beginning, it'll help you uh, work a little bit more efficiently and your end results will be nicer because you won't be trying to put details in the background and you'll be saving your details for um, for the foreground where really where they're really going to be noticed and, and show up. If you have everything detailed, you lose the, um, you lose the, va the uh, depth because everything is in focus and then it doesn't look like anything has any depth, so. And I am going right over the edges of my sketch so that I'll end up with, um, I will not end up with a halo of unpainted canvas around everything. And carry on the color as you go behind the birds just to make sure that it doesn't look like you've got two different things behind him. Okay, and now for the foreground, um, I am going to kind of dab stippling technique here. Just I want to put down a bunch of chunky paint. So we're really going to use up a lot of this stuff that we mixed. So don't, that's not going to go to waste, which is nice want this to kind of really be rocky and rough. Some granite here, which is very prevalent in the state of Maine. Lots of granite. <laughs> These chunks of colors in there. Then you can scoop up another color on your brush. Now this is, we are just kind of like slathering it on here. And you'll see why we're being so um, so slathery with it in a minute. Get under the bird with your darker color. That way you'll have a little natural shadow in there and you won't have to paint it in later. You might need to adjust it a little bit later, but... Scoop up some of the lighter color. And then we're going to do a fun technique here for texture. I know I lost his foot there a little bit. That'll be fine though. Don't worry. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. A couple fun techniques here actually. And grab a little bit of that yellow ochre in there as well. Okay. So now what I want you to do is grab your paper towel 
it can be a dirty one. It doesn't have to be a nice fresh clean one because we're gonna make it pretty dirty. And we're gonna we're gonna pounce. Okay, we're just gonna keep dabbing and we're gonna get kind of a rocky texture. Acrylics are completely overlappable, so don't worry if you stamp out his little feet. We're, we can bring them back, so don't worry about that at all. We want a rough, rocky texture here. I did get a little bit back there, but I think I can just kind of smooth that out with a brush. Yeah, just grab any clean brush you have, and you can, if you get any in the background, you can just smooth that out. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to do is some spattering. And I am going to grab a piece of scrap paper, just a piece of newsprint here. You can use whatever you have. And I am just going to tear it. And that's going to kind of protect what I have above. And then I am going to grab a toothbrush. I'm going to take a little bit of that black. My toothbrush is pretty wet, and this is an old toothbrush, obviously. <laughs> Okay, and you need kind of like an inky consistency, so I dipped my brush in water already. I did that to make sure I cleaned it because I didn't know what color I'd spattered last time. And I'm just gonna uh, spatter on this rock texture. And I'm gonna move my mask and spatter on some more. And you can do that until you are happy with it. And you could do some white as well. Just got to clean your brush off. And this time I'm not going to mask and I'll just blend in any white that goes astray. Grab a little bit more water. That's you need a certain amount of water in it for it to for it to come off the toothbrush. You just want to make sure you have protected your work surface around you too. There. Now, something else you might want to do with a round brush. First, though, I am going to. Any any little speckles that went a little bit awry. I'll just smooth them out here. They'll just disappear in the background. Then you can take your round brush and you can put in bigger dabs of any of those colors that you've just speckled. So if you want some larger dabs of white, go right ahead. Just try not to make it too um, predictable. Don't, you know, that's a great thing about spattering and sponging is that you can't make it absolutely perfect. You can't line up all these little daubs and dabs, and that's what makes it look realistic. And you can do the same thing with the dark. Now, everything is still wet here, so if you want to wait and do this later, you can, um, but I'm just kind of getting this, the basics in here. You can put any cracks that you might want to put in the rock. I think sometimes because it blends at the stage, it can be a little easier to integrate things, but you don't you don't have to do it now. Once this is done to your liking, you'll want to let it dry before we go on and paint our focal object. Just make sure there's no bare canvas anywhere that um, that is not on the bird, because you don't want to have a halo around your bird when you're done. So we'll be back after this is all dry. Now that our background is dry, we can start blocking in the colors of our bird. And again, I'm going to go in with my bigger brush, the flat number 10. And I'm going to start in with my white. And I want to get the uh, the areas that are going to end up being white, basically. Um, and don't worry if you can still see a little bit of the pencil line underneath. That's totally fine. Um, I am going... Um, around the eye. I went over that little dark area on top of the eye because again when when we're doing acrylics we can always layer on top and um, I want to paint over more. I want to at least overlap into the areas that, um, that will have white right next to them because it will just be easier to work with in the future. And I'm going to get the belly here. And you might need a couple coats um, if 
you know, if you can still see some background through. It should be pretty good though because we just kind of feathered that background in. And the top of the legs. All right, now I'm going to grab a little bit of yellow ochre and put that kind of on my palette there. I just, I don't want to have a ton of it on my brush, but I want a little bit just so I can kind of warm up some of the, um, some of the feathers there. So a little bit on the cheek and a little bit on the chest here. Doesn't take very much pigment to, uh, to tint that white because the the colors are really strong here against the white. And I'm also going to do a little gray, so I'm just going to pick up a little bit of that black. Tap a bunch of it off. Just work it in. I want to make sure I don't have any gobs on my brush, because if I do, then I'll get streaks on the, uh, the area I'm painting, and that's not what I want. I'm just going to hit the edge of the bird here. and under the belly. Nice plump puffin, ready for winter. And maybe a little bit of a cooler shadow. First let me put a little bit of this next to the beak, this warmer gray. So this is a warm gray because it has a yellow ochre in it. And then to make a cooler gray, I just need to grab a little bit of ultramarine blue. And see how that looks a little cooler? This is cooler, that's warmer. And we can have some of this on the chest as well. And towards the back of the head. I know it doesn't look like much yet, but um, this is going to look a lot more realistic than just having uh, plain white there. And I'm going to clean my brush and wipe it so it's nice and dry and then go in with my black and the black areas. Just make sure you get all the extra uh, water out of there because you don't want it to dilute the paint. And if it's more comfortable for you to move your canvas, go right ahead. Sometimes you want to, you want to, you know, move stuff around so it's a little bit easier to paint. That's the advantage of sitting like at a table on an easel. You're kind of, it's kind of stuck standing up there. When I load the brush, I like to pull the uh, the paint like this so that I end up keeping the bristles nice and um, nice and flat and chisel edge, so I can get good detail in there when I want. Just want to accent that little uh, that little wing a little bit, and I can kind of use it on the chisel edge if I want to pull out any little suggestions of feathers too, so kind of keep that in mind. You can cover more area when you use the flat of the brush as well. So usually if you're using a flat brush, most of your strokes will be using going with the flat of the brush. Sometimes I do like kind of as I'm going in for detail or to get I'm getting close to an area I will start to turn it just so I can control the area a little bit better. And then I'm just going to pull out some of those little feathers on the, with the chisel edge of the brush. See right there it gives you that little feathery look and I'm going to do that underneath as well. Move my hand back so you can see. these little fluffy and it's okay if you start to run out of paint as you're doing this as you're dragging it out because that just gives it more of a feathery a uh, feathery look and then on top of the head we also have that um, some dark but I am going to turn it so I can reach a little bit easier take your time when you're doing the top see how I, I twisted it like that it just helps me get that nice, um, a nice control. I find when I go in with a round brush, if I'm trying to do that, I'll get like little ridges of paint and I don't get the ridges so much. 
with a flat. So I do try to do this this uh, base coating in and um, sharpening up the edges with the flat brush. But you can use whatever you're comfortable with. Now I feel like the white on my face has gotten a little big, so I feel like it should be uh, coming up a little bit more. So I'm just going to very gently pull that shadow up a little bit more. And it's not a ton, it's just a little bit. And I'm going to go in under the eye, wiggle my brush just to kind of stamp down the bottom of the eye shape there. And then I am going to drag that back like that. And if you do get a boo-boo like that, I'll show you how to erase it. I keep Q-tips handy and I simply just wet them and kind of squeeze out the extra water and then you can go right in there and erase it. Because we're working on a dry background, it's not going to bother the paint underneath, but it will get that paint um, that we just misplaced right where it needs to go. It gets it right out of there. So now I'm going in with the black and I'm going to get that little um, shape above the eye. And I'm also going to paint in the eye while I'm at it. And I can bring that. And this is the, um, not the smallest brush that came in the kit. It's the one that, it's the medium size brush, the round. And always think about turning that, that uh, picture around if you need to. I'm going to make some gray. And I am going to just grab some white. And I'm just making a little bit so I can do, brush mix it. And underneath this, this should be a little bit darker. So I'm going to go in and add that there. And that's going right up to the beak with that darker feather color. All right, I think I am going to switch to that smaller brush. You don't want to leave your brushes setting in water if they have a wooden handle because um, then the, the paint can crack and split. The handles will swell and then the ferrules can get loose and it's not very fun to paint with a loose ferruled brush. So I think I'm actually going to start in with some of the colors for the beak. Um, dry my brush off here because I just dipped it. I'm going to start in with this vermilion red because that's a pretty prominent color and I want to get that right in there. And so when I load up a round brush, I like to twirl my brush in the paint and that gives me a nice point. And then I'm going to go over and just kind of trace the beak. Now a round brush has more of a um, harder time pushing acrylic paint. That's why we don't like to use it to base coat. So kind of keep that in mind. You might even want to switch to your flat brush once you get um, once you get the edges, the details done. So I'm just kind of going to sketch in where I want this red to be. And then I'm going to fill it in. Now there will be some white stripes over it, but um, but we can we can layer because it's acrylics. It's just a little easier to do this than to paint around it like we would if we were uh, doing watercolors. Now I'm also going to take the same brush and the same paint and add a few other little red areas. We have got um, the bottom part of the beak here has red right there and the around the eye has red and then we're going to grab a little bit of the um, wipe off your brush wipe off the extra paint on your brush but you don't need to clean it just wipe it off then grab the lemon yellow 
and see there'll be just enough in there that you can mix up this color you need for this, I think it's like a waddle here. And I want to dab it in because it does have kind of like a leathery texture. And I think I'm going to add a little bit of white to that. Add a little bit more yellow and a little bit of white. So I'm going to go ahead and get some fresh white because that one's getting kind of messy. And I'll put another little puddle of white there because I know I'm going to need it. <laughs> Sometimes I lay my, well I often will lay my white out in a few small puddles instead of one big gob because it um, just gives me more opportunities to mix into it without contaminating it all. So this is going to be a more creamy opaque color and I'm going to start this up at the top of the beak. And go down like that and then that's also going to go up against this color here. And I think we're going to use a little bit of that in the feet too. And so we can kind of sketch the feet back in because I don't know about you, but I lost mine a little bit. <laughs> And this yellows tend to be more opaque and so do whites. So by just going in and sketching it with this color, it's just going to help us get that back. Well, we get the paint out, you know, there's no other, we don't really have another use for it right now because we've, we've painted all those areas. So this little puffin's kind of standing cross like it. It's kind of cute. And I do want to kind of go over the edge. I want to make sure that I have a nice crisp line there. And we'll be painting that darker orange, but I just wanted to kind of get an underpainting in there so it can stand out from the rocks. I don't want to have that, you know, raw canvas. It's not raw, it's primed, but I mean, I don't want that white canvas kind of showing through on the back. There, so we will paint over that, but that just kind of saves our space. Now I want to shape the face a little bit more, and I'm going to stick with this same brush. And I am going to make some gray. I'm just going to do black and white. Nothing too fancy. I can use some of that white though because that white already has black in it. Save the good white for something else. And what I'm going to do is little flicks on my brush. So I am going to turn this so I'm comfortable and I am going to start right here and just do little flicks all the way around. And that's going to show us the shape of the face a little bit better. And we can do a little bit up here too. <clears throat> and then we can use this color in the beak itself, maybe with a little bit more black in it. And that's going to fill in this remaining area right here. A lot of colors in this guy, huh? I mean, we're working with a limited palette, but there still are a lot of, a lot of colors here. I got a little sloppy there. Let's neaten that up. And to do the dividing line between the top and lower beak, I'm just gonna, I'm actually gonna load up my brush kind of like I was loading a flat, pulling it like that, and I'm gonna see if I can very carefully kind of work on that chisel edge I've made on this brush and just kind of, hopefully you can see that. Um, I'm resting my hand against the canvas so I don't, uh, so I don't wiggle it. I'm going to grab a little bit of black, loading it up again like a flat brush, so I end up with a flat edge rather than a pointed point on here, and just kind of pulling it through like that. And I also feel like I want a little bit of a dark on the outside of the edge of this, but it really does help. And if you're on an easel, this will really help too. Um, sometimes uh, you can use like a, a product called a mall stick, or you can even use a, a dowel with a you know, a cloth tied around the end and you can rest it against your canvas and you can kind of rest your hand against that while you're painting. It just makes it easier to um, to not shake while you're painting. And I'm going to put a little highlight on this area over the eye, but it's a gray highlight, not a white highlight. And I'm going to do a tiny white highlight in the eye and for that what I like to do is um, let's see what kind of point I can get on this brush. This might be, make sure you don't have any beads of water on the ferrule because that will slide down and ruin your highlight because you'll get a big gob of water where you don't want it. So I am going to 
load up my brush and just twist it so I get a tiny little point. And I'm going to give it a little highlight right in the eye. So I'm kind of like that. And that just kind of gives them a little bit more life and character. Now I want to do kind of highlight on the beak. And also on the outside of the beak on the on the head. The shiny feathers there. Okay. Oh, you know what? I realized I forgot to do... I'm just going to leave that. I know I need that white again, so I'm just going to leave that on the brush. I forgot to do the wing over here, so I'm going to go ahead and fill that in. So get this little wing. And I'm going to kind of tap my brush like that so I get a little bit of a featheriness. I think I'll have to go back in with a white and really put those little wispy feathers in, but this will do for now. I didn't want to, I didn't want to wait uh, any longer on this because I want that to be dry so I can do those little wispy feathers over it with the white. There, I almost forgot that. Okay, so now we're going to put some, um, don't leave your brush in the water, Lindsay. I do that all the time and that's why I warn you because I want you to not have that bad habit of leaving your brush in the water. It's awful. I've ruined so many brushes that way. Um, so now we're going to go back in with the straight white and we are going to put the little stripes on the um, puffin's beak. And we're going to start, we're going to twist our brush so we kind of come up with a point here. And we are just going to, they should be thinner. You can do this either way. I try both ways and see what way you like best. You can try it going from the outside of the beak in and like lifting up on your brush as you go to make it thinner. Or you can try it from the inside out, from the um, inside of the beak out and just be on the tip and then push it down more as you go. Whatever works better for you. I think it might be a little easier to go on from the outside and lift up. And don't be surprised if you have to do a couple coats of this because um, the, uh, the red wants to show through the white. And here we'll start at the, uh, we'll start at the beak, in the inside of the beak for the upper part. And I'm going to start right on the line of the beak, press and lift. Almost like you're making an S stroke. Press and lift, press and lift. Okay, we're going to move on down to the feet now, and I'm going to take the uh, vermilion, and I'm going to add both yellows to it because yellow ochre is nice and opaque and thick, and that is going to be nice to work with, and it's also going to tone down the redness in our vermilion. So we'll start with that first. Twirl your brush in there, and I'm going to go in and get the... Um, Kind of the toes of the beak, the beak, the the feet, not the webbing. I'm going to start with the uh, the part that would be kind of like the toes. I don't know what you call that in a bird. The talons maybe, but not just the, the area that's not the webbing is what I mean. And I'm going to do that on both feet. And get this one over here. Okay, now I'm going to grab a little bit of, I think I'll grab a little bit of brown, the burnt umber, maybe a little smidgen of the blue. That's going to make a nice neutral, and it's using colors we've already used, so we know it's going to match. And I'm going to add that right under those little toe parts on the edge that we can see for a little shadow. And clean my brush. Feel free to use a bigger bucket than this. My actual water bucket that I usually use is like, it's very old and it's this huge thing. It's, and it's a divided water water bucket. And it's just so grimy that I did. I was embarrassed to put this on camera because <laughs> it's so filthy, but that's what I use. Use whatever, uh, 
use whatever you have that works. Um, bigger is usually a little bit better with a water bucket because it will um, it will hold a lot more. And if your palette wants to dance around like mine is, you can take a little poster putty or some double-sided tape or just some balled up masking tape, put it underneath there so it will stay put while you're painting. All right. I mixed up way more than I need of this, but... And I've got my paint way too high up on my brush. So see that, what I was telling you on the first tutorial, not to let your brush get up close to the metal. So if that happens, because when it happens, you're not gonna have quite as much control. Clean that brush out. Dry it off well, including the handle area so that if you, there's beads of water, it's not going to slide down. And start again and reload so that you only have the uh, the paint on the lower half of your, of your bristles. Okay, well you can't really see this, like the same color as my bristles, but I only have paint on the, like, the lower third or lower half of it. I'm going to fill in this area with that color. I'm loading. I'm not trying. I'm trying not to get it up all over the brush, just on the bottom of the bristles. It can be really tempting. I got a gob there. It can be really tempting to want to like trowel it on, to like scoop it up like you're scooping sand or something, but that's not what you want because then you lose your control. Now I'm gonna grab a little of this yellow here. Got a little bit on the palette too. I'm just gonna take some yellow on its own to brighten up this color on the webbing. And just do that to the other webbing parts as well. That just gives it a little bit more brightness. And I want to add a little shadow now before I do my final details. And to do that, cleaning my brush, I'm going to add, I'm actually going to do a glaze. So I'm just wetting my brush a tiny little bit and grabbing some black. So this is a little watery. Can you see that? It's it's kind of, it would kind of want to beat up. Now the key with acrylics is that you cannot add more than 30% water. So if you're mixing up paint and water together, you should never have more than 30% water because that will underbind your paint and then it might, um, it might flake off your canvas. Okay, so this is nowhere near 30%. So what I'm doing is I'm going in with this watery paint and I'm glazing. I'm getting a shadow in there. Let's see, I'm running out of paint now. I do need to uh, spread out the shadow over there because it's a little too dark. So I'm just going in there, working over that shadow, spreading it out a little bit more. You want the darkest shadow right up against the object. So the darkest shadow should be right up against the feet, right under the feet. And then you want to just kind of feather it out a little bit. And that's all right how you can feather it out quite a bit because the, the puffin would have a little shadow under it. You can even go behind him like that and get a little shadow in there. And that won't take very long to dry. But it's just easier to do it now than to uh, try to sneak it in after we've done the claws and the other details and stuff. Okay, so now we've got a little, he's sitting firmly on the rock now. So now I want to do some highlighting and I'm just going to go in with the white. Oops, I got a little bead of water on my brush so I want to get that out of there before it slides down and ruins anything. And we got our white paint and this is going to go little choppy marks across the top of our toes. There we go. Give a little highlight there. And then we want to put the claws on there. Actually, we can do a little highlight on the, uh, I think I want to add, maybe add a little bit of yellow to that highlight because it's a little too cool to me. I think that white is a little on the cool side. So I had just a smidgen of yellow ochre. I'm just going to hit the edges of the feet with that. Oh, I think that looks a lot more natural. It barely is a difference, but I think it looks a little more natural. In fact, I'm going to go over the other highlights I put in there because this looks much more realistic. So I mean it's just, I mean look at that, it looks pretty white, but just that slight addition of the yellow ochre makes it look more natural. There we go. 
Okay, so now the claw is very simple. What we're going to do is clean our brush again. You're going to be an expert at cleaning your brush, if nothing else, by the end of this class. And grab some of this black paint, just a little bit on the tip. Twirl your brush so you have a nice point. And for this, I'm actually going to turn my canvas because I want to be comfortable. I am going to um, just go right on the tippy top of my brush and pull in a little claw. And of course, you could do it from the... Uh, you could do it the opposite way. You could go from the uh, from the foot out, but I think this might be because you're just almost just putting a little dab in there. So you could go this way. Either way, try both ways. See what you like the best. We'll do it that way over here. We'll so we'll, we'll press and then we'll lift and we'll curve and lift. The key is to work on the tip of that brush though, because you don't want to get you don't want to. Um, get too much. You can always go in there and make it fatter if you decide to. There we go. Okay, so now I'm going to look back and see if there's any place else I want to put a little more black while I have it on my brush. And I think I might define this line a little bit more. And maybe feather that up. And maybe a little bit. And if I want to make the edge softer, I can simply clean my brush with, and just leave it a little damp and just kind of spread the, out the edge. All right, and I think I'm going to take some of this brown color that we made for our shadow on the feet and use that up here on this little waddle. I'm just going to kind of tap a little semicircle in there. All right, and I think I might take a little bit of that black on my dirty brush and kind of pull it up in here. It seems like we do have a little bit of a very soft neutral coming up in here. And a little bit on the tip of the beak. Okay, now I'm going to grab my white. Let's see if that's dry. Yes, that wing is dry. See, I told you it dried really quick, doesn't it? And I am going to go in with my white. Kind of laid it in there by mistake. I got it all over the brush, but I think we'll be all right. And I'm just going to pull in some little wisps from the chest over that wing. It's actually kind of from the side of the of the bird. I just want those kind of wispy, wispy fluffs. And I can go anywhere else. I feel like I need to brighten up the wing. I mean, the uh, any place else I want to brighten up the feathers, I can go ahead and do that right now, too. So it's kind of tone on tone, but it does allow you to give that, get that texture. We'll braid it under the, under the eye. And if you feel like, boy, it doesn't have a lot of contrast from the background, you can use that there as well. And I feel like, let's see, I feel like either the body should come out a little bit more there. Yeah, maybe it should. I think I need to do a little bit of work with the wing in the body there. So I want to bring the body out a little bit there. Just kind of flick that out. Make it kind of integrate a little bit. And clean my brush and go to the black. And kind of wrap that around the body a little bit more. It's okay if the colors want to mix in a little bit there, that's fine. Oops, now see that's what I meant. I want to show you that really close because I don't want that to happen to you. Look at that raised up bead of water there. Can you see that? Catch the light. So that is not, that's why I told you to wipe the brush. I'll block that off. You can see when you get a bunch of water on the canvas, that's what it does. It wants to lift up whatever's underneath. Okay, so that's why I warn you about mixing water with your paint or mixing too much water um, or dripping on your paint. But, you know, cleaning, drying that brush all the way down the handle as far as you've dipped it will get those beads of color off so that they don't come back and haunt your painting. 
like that. Sometimes that you drop the paper, you drop the water, and you don't realize it right away, and then it's lifted up a, a substantial portion of your painting. So just kind of be aware of that. And now that you've seen me do it, I know you don't have to do it because you'll be smarter than I am. All right, in the top of the head, I feel like it's a little flat. Oh, that looks, now that looks much more like a puffin, just changing that line right there for me. Okay, so the only other thing I think I need to do to this is um, maybe just a little, I like, I like this crack in the rock, I just want to uh, enhance that a little bit. Um, but, you know, you could really go to town <laughs> on the rock and then end up like, spending all day on it, um, is to add a little bit of a blue shadow to the back uh, because the light, when it reflects off of the of the black feathers, it has a little bit of a blue cast, just like the light on the feet had a little bit of a yellow cast, you know, because things are bouncing around, the light's bouncing. So I'm going to grab a little bit of the ultramarine blue, I mean a little bit, and I'm gonna grab some of that white. And I think there's enough like gray just hanging around here that I don't need to really do much. And I don't want to put a lot on there. In fact, I'm going to clean my brush because I'm afraid of getting too much on there. I'm going to just blot it. I'm not going to dry it super good. I am going to get the handle just in case there's any uh, any beads of color. And I just want to get some watery paint. So I'm on a damp brush here. I didn't dry it off super, super thoroughly, but I did blot off the excess water. I'm going to turn this. Now it's going to be, the place getting this highlight is going to be the wing in the back. Okay, so not the chest and the neck. So I'm going in and just pulling that over the wing. You can have a little bit on this side of the, not the neck, but behind the neck, like that. You could have a little in the back of the head if you want. And I do feel like maybe I need to do a little something on the beak, just with a tiny little bit of paint. I feel like the bottom beak would have a little bit of a, sh a highlight on it, so very little paint on my brush. I'm just kind of wiggling my brush up to the uh, seam where the upper and lower beak meet and just kind of pulling down a highlight. And I kind of also feel like I'd have a little highlight up here too. There. Oh gosh, that's fun. I hope you enjoyed this painting. This was a lot of fun to paint. Um, and of course, if you wanted to have more texture in your background, you could do that. If you wanted to have a, you know, more in focus background and have like w crashing waves, you could do that too. Um, make it your own. But now you know the uh, the basics of working with the brushes and the paints that come in this set. Uh, thank you so much for joining me in this lesson. And um, I hope you enjoy the next one. If you would like more free tutorials and projects, you can find me at lindsaywyrick.com or YouTube slash The Frugal Crafter. Again, I'm Lindsay Wyrick for Royal and Langnickel, inspiring the artist in everyone.